Now telling the compelling and moving story of a daring priest who saved the lives of over one million children. Would you believe, and please be advised, this program contains some upsetting scenes. Root causes of war are in our oil, diamonds, on the arms trade. For us in Biafra, this was a war of survival. We are there trying to defend ourselves and try to remain alive at the end of it all. You really lived your vocation to the hilt. You know, it was um, a matter of life and death every day. I do, I do not forget, and as to those I hold to be responsible, I don't forgive. All I wanted was that the war would end and the children be saved. On the 1st of October 1960, the British colony of Nigeria became independent of British rule. Seven years later, the southeastern region broke away and formed Biafra, an oilish republic dominated by the Igbo tribe. Nigeria blockaded Biafra by land, air and sea, which led to a devastating famine. Irish missionaries working in Biafra risked their lives to feed the starving population. One Holy Ghost father came up with a daring plan to beat the blockade. He set up an illegal airline and saved the lives of over a million children. A unique team of filmmaker priests captured the heroic airlift and the horrors of the world's first televised famine for RTE's RIAG series. The public response was unprecedented. The image is and will always be the image of the dying child suffering from this very slow death People created this problem, and I always believed that those children were sacrificed on the altar of oil. And the next thing, what have we? Yeah, and the, 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 Paris. The, the, the Father Tony Byrne is the Holy Ghost missionary priest from Cabra in Dublin. He was based in Aguilary when the conflict broke out. It became a very, very difficult situation. The Nigerian government tried to get them to surrender by starting a blockade by land, sea, and air. So we were totally trapped in this country called, with 14 million people. When the Nigeria-Biafra war was at its height, a young Holy Rosary nun from County Down, Sister Grony Fitzpatrick, was matron of Ihala Hospital. I was sent off to Ihala Hospital, and it was between two war fronts. We had Onitsha on one side, which was being shelled. We had Uli Airstrip on the other, which was being bombed, and we were wedged in the middle. As a young man in Biafra, Dr. Linus Afaya joined the army and fought for Biafran independence. He would later come to Ireland to study and practice medicine, but he still remembers the brutal conflict. The Nigerian soldiers, they had very heavy artillery, very heavy guns, and uh, supported by mortars and shelling and air, air raids. So whenever they want to attack, they pound the place for 24 to 48 hours. And when such happens, at the end of it, you find out who is still alive. I traveled to Kent in the south of England to meet internationally renowned author Frederick Forsyth. Frederick was a young BBC journalist in 1967 when he was sent to Biafra to cover the unfolding war. It was going to be a very short little war. Uh, the um, British High Commissioner, Ambassador, in Lagos had advised London that uh, the Nigerian army would cope with this um, cooks and bottle washers uprising in the Eastern Territories in short order, probably be 10 to 14 days, and they, they the Nigerian army, British trained, um, overwhelmingly northern Muslim Hausa people would sweep through the Igbos, and that was the end of that. That was my briefing. This was it went on till uh, February of 1968. Now, war has now been on for nine months and um, still no resolution. Starvation was used as a weapon of war. 
we are blockaded on all sides and uh, they prevented people bringing in food, bringing in medicines. So it became a very, very difficult situation. And 2,000 children were dying of a disease called Gwashiorkor. Now, Gwashiorkor is a protein deficiency disease, and it causes the swelling of the tummy, the matchstick legs, and the hair goes red. And it's a very slow, painful death of children who suffer from this disease. Father Byrne knew the only way to get the desperately needed supplies through the blockade was by air. He hatched a daring plan with the support of many Christian churches and Pope Paul VI. He then approached a notorious mercenary pilot. Hank Wharton was the gunner, and he kept saying, I want to do something to save the children. So he said that about four or five times. I said, Hank, you know, you have mentioned your love of children. I want you to prove that for every five flights I give you, I want you to give me a free flight. And he looked at me very sternly, and he said, I will. Father Tony's arrangement with Hank Wharton was short-lived, as one mercenary pilot could not hope to supply the needs of the ever-growing, starving multitude. So, Father Tony came up with an even more ambitious plan. We bought four DC-7s, second hand. And we started an organization called Joint Church Aid, it was JCA, and the pilot said it was Jesus Christ Airlines. To this day, it is the only illegal mercy air bridge that's ever been formed. It was illegal because the Nigerian government forbade entry into its airspace by even relief planes. It was condemned by the British government, and yet uh, the first planes began to fly. The cargoes, uh, broadly speaking, arrived in Sao Tome by ship. They were broken down into um, sort of crates. Um, these were put on, well, basically rather clapped out old planes to fly the food in. We are serving not the government or the army. We are serving the army civilian population, the women and the children who are starving and who are depending on our food. Father Tony recruited pilots from all over the world to fly his planes. Every day, they risked their lives to bring food to the starving people of Biafra. They knew it was risky, but they were extraordinary men. I mean, I couldn't pay them very much, and they weren't paid very much. And for a long time, there was no insurance. Dublin Airport, almost 50 years later. Father Tony Byrne and his colleague, Sister Kathleen McGuire, are waiting for a flight from Iceland. He's meeting one of his former pilots, Angermer Johansson. Honey, my brother. <laughs> Angermer still remembers the routine around every flight that brought aid to Biafra. The typical day you went in there, sometimes if you, if you were lucky enough to be able to take off before sunset, and you could possibly make three flights a night. Uh, its, flight was, uh, its leg was maybe a little bit more than two hours. So you made two hours, turn around up in Uli. Um, took maybe 20 minutes to get all the food off. The flights from San Tome to Uli in Biafra were fraught with danger. Danger from the Nigerian army, who tried to shoot them down. And danger from the darkness, as the runway at Uli was just a stretch of covered road. The military activities all over. And when we are offloading the airplane in the darkness, uh, the bumpers and the, and the fighters came over. Of course, the thought crosses your mind, what's going to happen today? I think I flew in 136 trips. And uh, every third trip, we had some military activity, either shooting, bombing, uh, or shooting from the ground. Many pilots failed to reach their destination safely. My Canadian friend, he said, I'd be flying the plane in on Friday night. He said, can I bring you anything? And I said, we haven't seen butter for a long, long time. If you could bring us in some butter. And he said, sure. On Saturday morning, Father Van Nukun said, there's been a plane crash. So over I went to the mortuary and I pulled back this, 
a sheet, and there was my pilot lying dead on the trolley. Oh, it was an awful shock. It really was. Yeah. This has been a big sorrow for us, and I hope and pray that we won't have have this accident or any other accident again. Many more crashes did follow. At least 37 pilots and crew were killed by accident or else shot down by the Nigerian forces. Brother Ignatius Curry from the Liberties in Dublin performed an essential task in Biafra. He was involved in the distribution of the food that arrived on the flights from San Tome. We were maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 miles from the airport, but you could feel the shudder of the bombs when, and the noise of them when they were bombing the airport. And if the bombing was very heavy, we knew that there wouldn't be much food coming in that night. We had roughly 100 lorries on the road, and around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I would uh, fuel the lorries, give the drivers their instructions and send them off. The relief supplies that came in kept the hospital going. We couldn't have carried on the hospital without, without that backup. We really couldn't in regards to food and uh, medical supplies and all of that. You know, we depended on it. The Irish priest wanted to show us what we were doing and uh, what was us to a feeding station. Instead of 1,500 children, approximately, there were around 3,000 of them. They want to touch us, sing for us, hold our hands, and whatever. I remember one little boy, he didn't want to let me go. And, uh, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I, I don't, I can't tell anything more. But it was so difficult. I can see 50 years later, it's still difficult for you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can imagine your children in this position. This particular day, this woman barely able to walk herself. She was very badly malnourished, a skeleton. And crawling behind her was a little girl who I thought was a child of maybe four or five, a baby crawling. And it turned out that her, the girl was 12 years of age but she was so weak and so emaciated that she couldn't stand and couldn't support herself. And that memory is born into me. In 1969, a unique crew of Irish filmmaker priests travelled to Biafra to capture the work of the relief agency Caritas for RTE's groundbreaking rare television series. The Irish Rose left the port of Dublin on its way to West Africa. Father Dermot McCarthy was the Ryark cameraman. We arrived into Uli, and in pitch dark, a door opened, and I saw this man, white teeth and white eyes, and he was smiling up. All I could see in the dark was, welcome to Biafra. <laughs> and that was Biafra, our arrival there. Today, a small truckload of dried fish has come to the village. The first food to come here since the federal troops retreated a week ago. The ration is one dried fish for each family. The Ryark documentary, Night Flight to Uli, had an immediate and devastating impact on Irish viewers. What you were looking at was absolutely appalling. It was the first time that the Irish people saw images of starving kids in their sitting rooms and kitchens. And I remember one time uh, we were filming a bush clinic with this nun, Sister Lucy O'Brien, and uh, the mothers brought the children and they stick-like legs and arms and swollen heads and bulbous eyes and uh, extended stomachs. Well, they bring tears to a storm. <laughs> Uh, once you say Biafra, the first thing that comes to mind is the suffering and uh, what people had to do to survive. Uh, uh, people were eating anything at all they can lay hands on. And they've been living on what they could find. In the 
journalists are not robots, we're not automata. Um, we have feelings, and I've seen seasoned, uh, hardened uh, reporters come down to Biafra and be in tears. So when you watch children die, it scars you. The missionary, priests and nuns worked every day in the face of death. Father Dennis Kennedy remembers one Nigerian air raid in particular. I was lying behind a very big tree. There were dozens of people around me, everyone screaming. I said, Lord, I don't want to die here. I, I was in about 30 years of age, and uh, I felt if my name wasn't on these bullets, I might survive, and thankfully, they weren't. There were 11 people died around me, and about 100 injured, but the bullets weren't meant for me. Even the hospitals that treated the sick and wounded fell victim to the deadly Nigerian bombing. About 11 o'clock, this MiG fighter just swept over the hospital, ran three times and strafed, and it happened so quickly. It was all over before we realised just how much damage had been done. The children's ward was the worst. Children's ward got a uh, rocket right through the roof. There was a mother and child killed in bed. We ended up with 120 on the theatre list. Then in the A and E, the injured were all laid out on the floor, and um, the nurses were going round giving injections. Father McNulty was going round anointing. So it was a real battlefield. The response of the Irish public to the images they saw on the Rark documentary was phenomenal. Food and donations flooded in from all over the country. What the people gave was fantastic. I remember the time when I got a parson from a little child in Ireland. Toys, she had sacrificed our toys to send it. And she said, please give this to some of those children who are very sick. But for a child to surrender her chosen, loved toys for the kids in Biafra, the generosity of the Irish is unbelievable, unbelievable. The dichotomy between the generosity of the Irish public and the government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was totally against what I was trying to do. Can we in any way help to bring about a ceasefire? All we can do is give good advice and appeal to them to be sensible. Ireland adopted a carefully neutral stance, but Britain actively supported the Nigerian government with weapons and strong-armed diplomacy. The British Foreign Office, to its, in my view, eternal shame, sent emissaries to every European country urging them not to donate, not to give any assistance at all. Uh, it, it was a pernicious document, a pernicious attitude, um, which I think shame, shames that office you know, forever. This was about predicting that what was a Tupni Apni tribal uprising in an obscure part of Nigeria would be crushed within a fortnight. This lasted two and a half years. Uh, and for the last year, the whole year of 1969, it was a major world humanitarian disaster, which the politicians and the civil servants wanted to ignore. That was it. Do you agree to that? We have agreed. All of them. The planes that came in from San Tome did more than just bring relief. They also ferried sick by African children abroad for medical treatment. But this act of mercy involved heartbreaking decisions. Hundreds have turned up hoping to have their children taken away to safety. You know, we just looked at them by eyes. And if they were very close to death, we didn't take them. They were rejected, sad to say. So I was in that unenviable position of deciding who would live and who would not live. But first, each child's name is written on a piece of plaster and stuck on his forehead to avoid later confusion. What is her name? Bibiana Akota. I remember one little child, a lovely looking child, and uh, she's waiting there for her future to be decided. But even though this is happening, this bureaucracy has to be filled and forms have to be filled, and great care was taken to make sure that the name of the child was recorded and she got a little metal tag around her head as well. So they did everything they possibly could to keep it um, 
uh, organized so that the children would be afterwards identified and returned to their parents. We picked 24 each time and uh, we took their photographs, we filled in all the documentation in quadruplicate and then we put them on the two jeeps to drive them back to Ihala Hospital. Now the screams of the children, everyone wanted to get on but when it came to the time of leaving, uh, the children were hysterical, didn't want to leave their parents of course and all the way back on bumpy roads they're screaming and crying and sick. so that was a horrible, horrible journey. I remember at least three flies where we took children from a war zone, maybe 10, 15 children at the same time. We put them into the hands of the nuns in San Tome. And then they very quickly as it became just normal. They were playing. But the sad thing, as I felt, was to take them back because the priests had to promise to bring them back. And then I just learned recently that they were all registered. I didn't know about that. They were all registered, so most of them landed in their hands with their parents again. And that is a very good news for me. After two and a half years of battle and starvation, the Biafran army laid down their arms and surrendered. The Nigerian Biafran war was over. I believe I was on the third from last plane out. I learned. I don't know whether there's accurate information, but it was a whistle behind the hand that I had a price in my head. So it was, uh, I was advised to, uh, to leave. As the plane was taken off, the Nigerian soldiers were coming in uh, to take over the airport and they were firing on the plane. And uh, as we took off the plane, uh, until we got to a certain height, was still being shot at. At the end of the war, we thought that every Biafran male, Igbo male, would have been rounded up and killed and so on. Some people did it, though. Some soldiers were doing it, but thanks to the head of state, Gowon, he declared no victor, no vanquished. The Nigerian army just marched into Ihala, thousands of them. And we had to shout their, their slogan, which was One Nigeria. And we didn't shout it loud enough. We were told louder and louder and louder. And I nudged the man beside me and said, how do you feel? He said, I can say it with my toe, but not with my heart. My heart is broken. The root cause of all, what was it about? It was about oil, because at that time, my dear friends, it was an international... Half a century later, Father Tony Byrne is making sure that the story of Biafra is passed on to a new generation. Tony Byrne was key to the whole project, being a success. It was a fantastic organisation to win such support from all over the world. So they told me to contact a guy called Hank Wharton. It was a cause for him, it was a cause. It was a, a life mission. And even 50 years later, it's a landmark uh, because never, I think, before so many children been saved from death. I often heard them described as being the green pimpernel, not the scarlet pimpernel. They seek them here, they seek them there, but they never got them and they never found them, thank God. Most of their supplies come from Caritas. Although hostilities ended nearly 50 years ago, the Biafran War and subsequent famine have left an indelible mark on all those who were there to witness it. That film is nearly 50 years old, but I still have a vivid memory of those images of the, of the children. I can see them in my mind's eye now, those little wasted bodies covering an entire football pitch. They're all dying. So, um, yeah, um, I, I, I do not forget. And as to those I hold to be responsible, I don't forgive. As far as I'm concerned, I decided the war is ended. We have to move on. I moved on, found my own niche, you know, and thank God I'm not begging for food today. And that is it. I did, yes. Yeah. 
I think we did something good. And the airlift probably saved at least a million lives. And I think that is what stands out. Thank you for coming. You're very good to be here. It was that, I think, that just impelled people to do something about it. We're a quarter of a mile from the mission. And that led to the start of concern. And in fact, another development agency, which also owes its origin to Biafra, was Médecins Sans Frontières. I think it's, it's always the innocent ones that suffer most. You'd wonder what's the sense in it all. There's no sense in it. But I think we've all seen pictures of pictures of pictures of dying children and slaughtered people and whatever. We've become inured to it, which we weren't 50 years ago. My attitude to be after was stop the war, stop this atrocity, stop this scandal and save the children. Next week, Would You Believe investigates the importance of faith in the 21st century, examining how spirituality, religious beliefs and moral dilemmas have affected people in Ireland and abroad. That's at 10.15. Next, it's The Week in Politics.